So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy, Ellen. I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So, last one we had Jeffrey Dahmer. We had Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy. We had a guy that had killed over 300 people. Um, a guy who was sentenced to a thousand and something years, but where he was at only allowed up to 30 years, so he may be released soon. I think he was arrested in 99. Like, do you see the pattern we've been following? And I'm thinking, ah, we can't keep going, can we? Voila, apparently we can. We're back with the top 10 people who the CIA fears the most, part three. Part three. I, I haven't even looked forward to see how many parts this is. Part three. Just let that sink in. Let that simmer. Let that marinate. It's country Wayne say, let that sizzle in your spirit. <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it. So we're going to get into the video, man. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Join the family. And, uh... Let's, let's analyze this part three. Here we go. Maybe it's the CIA, maybe it's the FBI, maybe it's just your local police department, but whoever it is, they set out to catch these kinds of guys from both identified and unidentified, as well as serial and just regular old fashioned plane killers. Here's part three of the top 10 people who the CIA fears the most. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Randy Kraft. Also known as the scorecard killer, Randy is a monster who took the lives of at least 16 young men between 1972 and 1983. The scorecard nickname comes from how, after his arrest, police found a coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14th, 19- There we go again. I always feel like when you hear stuff like that, they find a list of cryptic ways. I feel like they be wanting to get caught. I feel like they love the spotlight so much that the ultimate end game is them getting caught and their name living on in their mind as them being remembered for forever for the crimes they committed. That's what I be feeling about these dudes, man. Coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14th, 1983, two California Highway Patrol officers observed a car driving erratically and suspected the driver may be impaired, so they pulled it over. Once the car was pulled over, Randy Kraft got out and identified himself and subsequently failed all field sobriety tests. At the same time, the other officer went over to the passenger side where he sadly found Randy's final victim, 25 year old Marine Terry Lee Gambrel. The next two days of investigation revealed the horrors of what Kraft had done, and on May 16th, 1983, he was formally charged with the one crime, but many more charges came within the next months. His trial first began on September 26th, 1988, and on August 11th, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death, and the sentence was upheld. As of this year, he still remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, where he continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes, like they didn't find one of his victims in the passenger seat of his- I was just about to say that. He's gotta be the first. Bro, we found the body in your car. You got out and took a whole field sobriety test like you ain't have a body in the car. Are you kidding me? Man, go ahead and, and, and spill the beans, bro car while he was driving it. I'm just saying, I don't think he should be waiting around for that Oscar or anything. In our number nine spot today, we have the Long Island Killer. What would a list of horrifying people be without some of the dreaded unidentified serial killers? The Long Island Killer, of course, operated in the Long Island region and is said to have begun being active as far back as 1996, and it's entirely possible that they may still currently be active. At the moment, there is a range of 10 to 17 crimes that authorities believe could be linked to this yet to be identified person. Unfortunately, there isn't much that is known about who this person might be, but it's currently thought that they're likely a white male in his mid-20s to 40s with extensive knowledge of law enforcement operations and techniques, and they believe this because it would make sense as to why he has been so successful in avoiding capture so far. That's scary. When somebody who's who, who knows the system turns for the worse, and they know all the inner workings and secrets and how the police officers move, that man is dangerous, bro. 
That's that's like I guarantee that's some of their worst nightmares. Are as of right now, it is believed that his most recent victim was Natasha Jugo, who was found on the shore of Gilgo Beach on June 24th, 2013. In our number eight spot today, we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career, and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people, but through subsequent interviews, it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40. He just couldn't remember the names of them all. But he, of course, could remember the details of his crimes against them. His crimes started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim, and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12th, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crimes, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted, quote, Your Honor, you need to step down for 25 minutes, even after he was restrained and get- Oh yeah, he's all, he's all, he, like, I feel like they need to put him in solitaire or he gonna make that prison interesting, man. They need to put him in solitaire. For his outbursts. You know how on 60 Days, I was watching 60 Days, they make the ones who committed like murder and stuff have on different clothes than, than the other prisoners. Like he don't need that type of, he needs to be in his own area. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is what? absolutely unbelievable. Charles was sentenced to 18 consecutive life sentences and will be eligible for parole in 2,403. In our number seven spot today, we have Sean Great. Sean is a serial killer who committed a series of crimes from 2006 until he was apprehended in 2016. Throughout his decade of criminal activity, it is thought that he took the lives of at least five people. So basically, history is a little confusing, but in September of 2016, Sean was arrested and later indicted for two killings, as well as a kidnapping and harming a woman whose 911 call actually led to his arrest. At the same time, in another county next door, he was also being charged with two other deaths, as well as another one from all the way back in 2006. This final count from all of those years ago was actually an unsolved Jane Doe case who had been unidentified for 12 years at the time. When Sean confessed to this crime, he wasn't even sure who she was, he just said he believed her name was Dana. On May 7th, 2018, Sean was convicted on two of the counts, and on March 1st, 2019, he pleaded guilty to two of the others, and on September 11th, 2019, he pleaded guilty to the additional count. In the Just heartless. Couldn't even remember a name. Straight up heartless. I can't remember a name. I something. Like, 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 it, like the life just didn't have any type of meaning. And he was sentenced. That was somebody's daughter, sister, niece. I can't remember the name. She get extra years for that. To death and has remained on death row since that final plea and sentencing, and he is currently scheduled to be executed in 2025. In a bittersweet turn of events, in June of 2019, that Jane Doe victim was finally able to be identified through the DNA Doe Project, and she was identified as 23-year-old Dana Nicole Lowry from Minden, Louisiana. It definitely can't bring her back, but there is some comfort in knowing her family finally received some answers. Prayers to her family, well, to all the families families of these victims. In our number six spot today, we have Tex Watson. Tex Watson was one of the central members of the Manson family, which was led by Charles Manson, and was a willing participant for the horrible Tate and LaBianca crimes that took place on August 9th and 10th, 1969, which if you don't know about them, I can't detail a lot of what happened here, but I can tell you that the events that took place on those nights were horrible, gruesome, and insanely unnecessary. In October of 1969, Tex knew his arrest was coming, so he fled to his home state of Texas, but was later arrested and extradited back to California. Once he was in California, he refused to talk or eat and ended up losing 55 pounds, which got him sent to get tested to see if he was fit to stand trial, which he was. In 1971, he was convicted on seven counts of first degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit. He originally received a death sentence, but it ended up being commuted to life in prison. While in prison, apparently this guy's been living the life, however, because he has not only been able to release a book while inside, but he also got married and through conjugal visits, has fathered four children with his then wife. How? 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 Somebody make that make sense to me. How does that even go down? How? 
Conjugal visits, I've heard of those. Getting married, having kids, I guess from the conjugal visits. So you can, but getting married, all of that type of stuff, like, is is he in prison or is he at an island resort? Which one is? It? Somebody tell me. And it sounds like he's having a good old time. Why? I actually wish that I was making that up. They did get divorced in 2003, though, because she apparently had met someone else, which I'm like, yeah, I hope so. In our number five spot today, we have right. David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, or the son of Sam, is an American serial killer who terrorized New York from July of 1976 to July of 1977. He took the lives of six people and wounded seven others, all the while eluding the biggest manhunt in New York City history. He was one of those arrogant ones who leaves the little notes for the police, promising to do it again. Well, his arrogant self was caught for his crimes and he was arrested on August Read this note, y'all. Hunt in New York City history. He was one of those arrogant ones who leaves the little P.S. J.B., please inform all the detectives working the case that I wish them the best of luck. Keep them digging, drive on, think positive, get off your butts, knock on coffins, etc. Upon my capture, I promise to notes for the police promising to do it again by all the guys working on the case, a new pair. Yeah. Well, his arrogant self was caught of shoes. If I can get up the money. Oh, <laughs> I bet when they caught him, they, they ain't taking him right to the station. They, they made a few pit stops first. <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. I'm playing for his crimes and he was arrested on August 10th, 1977 and was indicted for his crimes. He confessed to all of them and claimed that he was just obeying the orders of a demon that had manifested itself in the form of a dog that belonged to his neighbors. These killers really like to come up with some outlandish excuses. It's so wild. He was found mentally competent to stand trial and he pleaded guilty to his crimes, which left him sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. He later admitted to making up the dog story, which like, Oh, really? But he did say that instead, he was a member of a violent satanic cult and his crimes were committed as a part of that. These claims were investigated, but no one has been able to confirm or deny them. And at this point, he's like the boy who cried wolf. So it's just hard to say for sure. In our number four spot today, we have the Doodler. While this nickname sounds very sweet, it, like everything else on this dark, dark list, is very sinister. The nickname that this unidentified killer received is due to his practice of sketching his victims before taking their lives. I told you it was sinister. Mr. Don't say I didn't warn you. This identified killer committed their crimes in the San Francisco area from January of 1974 to September of 1975, and they specifically targeted the gay community. It is believed that 14 deaths can be attributed to this killer, while three others were injured in the process. Unfortunately, because of stigma and the sensitivity surrounding gay men at the time, the three who survived this monster were very reluctant when speaking with authorities for fear of being, quote, outed as a result of it. This has led to there being very little information for them to work with in terms of identifying the man responsible. For a while, there was a primary suspect, but that person has never been officially charged because, sadly, none of the survivors felt comfortable enough to testify in court. There's a very real chance that authorities know who the killer is, but just don't have the evidence to prove it in a court of law. That truly is a terrifying thought. In our number three spot today, we have Quincy Allen. Sometimes when I'm researching for these videos, I come across somebody that I haven't heard of before, and their story absolutely blows me away, and this is definitely one of them. Quincy Allen is a man who went on a crime spree between July and August of 2002, where he took the lives of four people. His crime spree was actually inspired while he was in prison serving time for stealing a vehicle. It was here that a fellow... Wait a minute. Let me... Let, let, me, get, let me get this straight. He's in prison and gets inspired in prison to get out of prison to commit, more, to commit a different type of crime. That don't sound like rehabilitation to me, bro. That sound like he's in prison and he, he went to prison with with a, a bachelor of stealing cars and came out with a doctorate of murdering people. Like, how? how? That's why I was talking about earlier, bro. Like, rehabilitation has got to be better inmate decided to start recruiting others and told him that he could get Quincy a job as a mafia hitman. I can't imagine what that's like. Is that like when those MLM girls slide in your DMs? Hey, girly. 
You could be making this much a month. <laughs> when Quincy was released, he decided to buy a shotgun so he could start practicing. Man, I wish he showed this kind of dedication to literally anything else. Quincy started off his horrific crime spree on July 7th of 2002 by attacking a 51-year-old homeless man who was sleeping at the time. Luckily, this man was able to survive the attack. His crimes continued until he was arrested on August 14th, 2002. After his arrest and trial, Quincy received a sentence of death and is still on death row awaiting execution. His sentencing did not deter him from the criminal life, however, as in 2009, Quincy, along with another inmate, planned an attack on a correctional officer at the prison they both reside at. In the end, the guards had to use rubber bullets to subdue the pair. The correctional officer they attacked thankfully didn't succumb to his injuries, but he was forced to find another job as after the attack he was suffering from- oh, this You wouldn't have had to force me? Oh, that's it, I'm done. And that's crazy, bro, because if you watch some of those shows, those guards have literally no protection, no barrier between them and those inmates. And the number of inmates to guards, that ratio is staggering, bro. Just watch it 60 days in. It's like you're looking at like 50 inmates to one guard at this desk. And this desk don't have no barriers around it or nothing to keep them. No, they be all behind the desk, all up, up next to the the uh, correction officer. I'm like, what? No protection, none. Like, I I feel sorry for them. I seen some of them in that show, man from PTSD and anxiety attacks, and all the charges pertaining to this specific attack were later dropped by prosecutors who suggested that there was no point trying someone who was already on death row. This did, however, get Quincy and the other inmates stripped of all of their privileges at the time, which included outside recreation, visitation, phone use, and canteen items. Quincy was intended to be executed on January 8th, 2010, but there was a state of execution that was accepted and a new date has yet to be announced. In our number two spot today, we have Edmund Kemper. Edmund Kemper is an American killer who was convicted for taking the lives of 10 people, including his paternal grandparents, as well as his own mother. He is apparently most notable, I'm gonna say, aside from the fact that he's a serial killer, for his height of six foot nine, and he is apparently quite intelligent with an IQ score of 145. Impressive height and IQ score, less than impressive choices though. His first crime took place when he took the lives of his grandparents. After this crime, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent time in a hospital before it was determined he was rehabilitated and he was released at the age of 21. After his release, he unfortunately went on a spree where he would target young females who were hitchhiking. After his final crimes, he ended up confessing and turning himself in, which is something we definitely don't see a lot of the time. When asked in an interview why he confessed, he said, quote, the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Just gonna let that sink in. Three court-appointed psychiatrists examined and observed him and found him to be legally sane, and thus he was able to stand trial. On November 8th, 1970. Yeah, y'all knew that by his IQ score. I don't even know what y'all even conducted that test for. A three, the jury deliberated for just five hours before returning with a verdict of guilty. He has been eligible for parole since 1979 and has been denied every time he applied, one time saying, quote, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He is eligible to apply for parole again next in 2024, which is kind of terrifying. I'll agree with him on that quote. We are not ready for you and I don't think we ever will be. In our number one spot today, we have Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietman. Known as the serial shooters, the crimes these guys committed are definitely on the list of fears I have, which I'm pretty sure spawned from my Criminal Minds episode. These two were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006, and basically they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random drive-by shootings. That's the really scary part. The fire thing is also bad, don't get me wrong. There's just something about completely random acts of violence that really scares me. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify- Yeah, because they, they didn't care who it was, just random. Like, that makes you nervous because you could have been anywhere and they just pulled up. By the perpetrators of these horrible crimes, in particular, one from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was found guilty of 80 out of the 87 felony charges that were brought forth, and that was all in one single trial. The charges included the killings and attempted killings he had done, arson, animal cruelty, and drive-by shootings. In the end, he was sentenced to death six times, and 
and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While Dale sat on death row, he apparently asked to be put to death, quote, as soon as possible, and in the end, in 2013, he decided to take his own life in prison. To this day, Samuel still remains in prison. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thank you so much for checking it out. I've Listen, man. Like, this makes me want to bulletproof everything. These videos make you want to bulletproof everything. Your car, your clothes, your hats, your, like, put something over your face. That needs to be bulletproof. Your house needs to be bulletproof. Like, I feel like I want to bulletproof everything, fam. This is crazy, bro. It's crazy. Scary. Crazy. But you need to hear it. You need to hear what's going on out there. You know, step outside of your bubble and hear this stuff. Because this is real life and it's scary. So, y'all be safe. Take the necessary precautions. Protect yourself and your family. And um, we're going to see if they got another one. I'll check, it. I'll check and see if they got another one. So, you know, I'm going to bring it back. We're going to check it out. All right? It's your boy L, man. Until next reaction, I'm gone. Peace.